My friend Kerry Newhoff earlier this year came up with a great line that is a word from the Lord for the church in 2020. He said, flexibility is ability and agility is a superpower. I'm going to come back to that, but let that sink in for a minute. Flexibility is ability and agility is a superpower. I think he's right. I mean, our society was already in a state of flux. Uh, with change happening all around us at a head spinning rate and then came coronavirus and when the world moves into crisis mode the rate of change doesn't diminish it actually accelerates and if the church is to survive never mind thrive it needs to be aware of the changes that are taking place and adapt its ministry to the changing times now, I've said this a hundred times before. It's the method that changes, not the mission. Jesus and his word are unchanging. How we communicate truth has to change. Take, for example, the fact that the majority of you are listening to this message from home via the internet, very possibly in your pajamas. I will say that as I look around the room, no one in this room is in his or her pajamas. Not that there would be a problem with that, but anyway. But if we hadn't set up some sort of live streaming option, you wouldn't be able to do this. We wouldn't be able to have everybody here. I shake my head sometimes at the fact that I was actually ahead of the curve on something. Because we've been live streaming for a few years now, but we need to take it seriously, and that means an investment in equipment, which we're working on. I hope to put it to work as soon as the last component arrives. But from the middle of the first century, from the, the, the church was composed of those called out by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and called together to worship him on his day. Do not forsake meeting together as is the habit of some, says the writer of Hebrews, and we've taken that seriously. But in the middle of a pandemic, many people have had to forsake meeting together, either for the sake of their health or to uh, abide by emergency regulations. That's why if people can't be the church gathered, we have to figure out whatever means possible that we can bring the church out so that the church can be effective as the church scattered. This season has taught us many things. And one of them is this. The church can be the church without a building. I'm grateful to you who are coming here because it's so great to see you. And I'm grateful for you who are watching online too because all of you who are watching online couldn't possibly fit in this space with the regulations that are before us right now. And our current reality is a great illustration of why being willing and able to change is so important. Human beings have a propensity for stability, especially as we age. I am finding now that change is getting harder and harder for me than it used to be. And I don't know why that's the case, except I guess that I'm getting old. <laughs> but I find it easier to maintain than innovate. But if leaders only maintain and don't innovate, then all we're going to see is decline in the midst of a culture that is constantly in a state of change. Change and decay in all around I see, said the hymn, but I remind you that that hymn is Abide With Me. And when do we sing Abide With Me? Yeah. At funerals. I've never served a congregation more open to change than this one, and for that I'm grateful to God. But we cannot rest on our laurels. When we emerge from this pandemic, whenever that is, there are many churches that will not come out of it alive. And the session is determined that this will not be one of those. To live is to change. To live well is to change often, wrote John Henry Newman. And he was right. Willingness to change is going to be one of the hallmarks of the church that thrives in a post-pandemic world. And that means 
we will have to try more <laughs> new things. We never did it that way before, is the seven last words of the church. Those are not our words. In case you're wondering, I will tell you, this is as much a pep talk for me as it is a prophetic word for you. I can't back down on my own willingness to stretch and grow. If I sit back and manage, we're, we're done. We, I have to lead. The session has to lead. And as we approach the seventh chapter of Romans, Paul has moved from writing about license to sin, where we learn that God's measureless grace does not mean we can sin willy-nilly, to writing about legalism, where the way we've always done things does not abide. Romans 7, 1 to 6. Now, dear brothers and sisters, you who are familiar with the law, don't you know, yes, you do, that's what's implied, that the law applies only while a person is living. For example, when a woman marries, the law binds her to her husband as long as he is alive. But if he dies, the laws of marriage no longer apply to her. So while her husband is alive, she would be committing adultery if she married another man. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law and does not commit adultery when she remarries. Now, a lot of people get distracted by this illustration that Paul uses about marriage. This passage isn't about marriage. It's about the relationship of the believer to the law. So see this as an example, not as a statement about marriage and adultery. Because frankly, if Paul were intent on making a statement about marriage and adultery here, he could have done a better job. <laughs> he would have brought up the point that, you know, in both Roman and Jewish law, there was provision for remarriage after a proper divorce was settled and so forth. There are other texts in the New Testament that handle the, the issue of marriage and divorce. This is just an example that Paul is using. He's trying to help us understand what happens when something dies. And he makes that clearer in verses 4 to 6. So, he says, my dear brothers and sisters, this is the point. You died to the power of the law when you died with Christ. And now you are united with the one who was raised from the dead. As a result, we can produce a harvest of good deeds for God. When we were controlled by our old nature, that's the flesh, the human existence apart from God, sinful desires were at work within us. And the law aroused these evil desires that produced a harvest of sinful deeds resulting in death. But now we have been released from the law, for we died to it and are no longer captive to its power. Now we can serve God not in the old way of obeying the letter of the law, but in the new way of living in the Spirit. Now, I don't think it's ever been more clear than it is today that human beings are given to extremes. Take, for example, the use of masks. As we seek to beat down this coronas, coronavirus pandemic, we have at one extreme the people who will say, you are a filthy human being if you do not wear a mask indoors, outdoors, in bed, in the shower, wherever you go, because masks are the only thing that are going to save the human race. At the other extreme, we have those who say, masks are just another way for the government to control the people. Who knows what they'll go for next? Maybe we'll all get microchips inside our heads. Now, I don't think either of those extremes is helpful. Neither blind loyalty nor covert conspiracy is the best way to approach anything, let alone the health of seven billion people. Flexibility is ability, and agility is a superpower. We have learned to adapt to wearing masks when we have to. We have to do this when it comes to faith, too. When I was a new Christian, I wanted to please God so much that I drifted into legalism. I wanted to follow the letter of the law to, to, as perfectly as I could to prove how much I loved God. And I wanted everybody else to follow the letter of the law too. What happens with some folks is that they find legalism wanting and then they drift into antinomianism or license 
They, they want no oppressive laws. They want to be free to do what they want, have nobody else telling them what to do. Neither of these extremes is helpful either. In legalism, there's no room for grace, and in license, there is no room for discipline. In Romans 6, the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Rome that continuing in sin because there is so much grace makes no sense because in Christ we have died to sin. And he says that we are set free from sin and should not be slaves to it. In chapter 7, he carries on the conversation by turning again to the law. So clearly in that church, there were these two extremes of legalism and license that existed within even the first century Roman church. Some want to be completely free from following the law or responsibility, and others want to be wed to the law like a security blanket. Even though this was written 2,000 years ago, perhaps we can agree that the human race still has a problem with sin. Are we okay with that? The human race still has a problem with sin. If you're not sure about that, you might want to change the channel. <laughs> you all don't have that option, but you can get up and leave. Uh, but uh, if you want to change the channel, before you do that, you might think about, oh, meet the press or question period or maybe a rerun of The Bachelor or a rerun of Hockey Night in Canada. There's lots of used sports on these days. But before you change it, understand that any of those things you switch to are going to be illustrations writ large of the reality that we still have a problem with sin in the world. What gets missed by so many is that the human race has a problem with sin, but God has graciously provided us with a solution. That solution is not legalism. That solution is not license. So what is it? I don't mean to seem morose, but the solution is actually death. Now, that doesn't mean the only way to solve the problem of sin is to die. Uh, true, when we die, we are no longer under the constraints of the law. But that's not what Paul's getting at here. As he pointed out in the past couple chapters, what gets defined as sin is what we do in negative comparison to the law. You can't just define sin arbitrarily, right? God has done that for us when he set down the law of Moses in the Old Testament and the ways that the New Testament builds on that. So in order for sin to cease to be a problem, we have to die to the law. The law loses its power when you die, just as a marriage ceases to exist when one or another spouse dies. But we're not talking about physical death here. We're talking about spiritual death. Don't miss this. Followers of Jesus have been set free from the binding authority of the law of Moses by the death of Jesus on the cross. So if you want to sin less, and if you want to see less sin in the world, the answer is faith in Jesus for all. And I'll come back to that. In chapter 6, Paul said that we die to sin and are set free from it, and that freedom from sin leads to serving and producing fruit. In chapter 7, Paul says that we die to the law and are set free from it, and that fr bad freedom from the law leads to serving and living by the Spirit of God, which produces fruit. So what we're really grappling with here is kingdom living for all the right reasons. A lot of people want to try and keep it in both camps, right? They want to live for the kingdom of God, but they also want to live in the world's way and to be popular with the world. But we can't do that. The Bible tells us that we are to be in the world but not of the world. But so many people want to be in and of the world, but also in and of the kingdom of God. And what happens is that our attempts to try to live for God in the world but still do the world's thing sucks us into the world and sometimes unknowingly where sin and death are so prevalent. The point is to live kingdom values in the world's context and that's hard. Producing fruit for God in a hostile world is difficult. So Paul is encouraging the church to avoid the extremes to which the human race is given. Licentiousness, 
because we've died to sin and been set free from it to serve God and produce fruit. And legalism, because we've died to the law and are free from it, leading us to serve in what verse 6 calls the new way of living in the Spirit. We're called to live not by the letter of the law, but by the Spirit of the law, because we've died to sin and died to our bondage to the law. Before we come to faith, we are under the burden of the law, but by the death of Jesus, we are set free from that burden. In another of his letters, Paul writes, the old written covenant ends in death. But under the new covenant, the Spirit gives life. Current example of that writ large has come to us courtesy of Orthodox Judaism. The Apostle Paul understood what we would call Orthodox Judaism because he started out as a Pharisee, a legalist of legalists. And throughout his ministry, he struggles against the legalism that that approach brings. Recently in New York City and in Jerusalem, deaths from coronavirus were unusually high among the Orthodox Jewish community solely because they would not abide by social distancing laws in gathering for worship. They knew what the law of Moses said, and they knew that that was what they had to do to obey God. But the law did not allow them to be flexible by obeying the law of the land at the moment, which was stay six feet away from the next person. There was and is no sense of grace there, no sense that things could change because of the circumstances, and a lot of people died as a result of that legalism. The law brings death, but the spirit brings life and peace. Again, this is not about the substance of what we do, but about how we go about it. For example, we've learned the need to put significant resources into online broadcasting. Uh, my hope is that in the next few weeks, what you see here, you who are here, is not going to be here anymore. Things will look an awful lot more like they had before, but we're going to have new equipment that is going to enable us to be able to broadcast more effectively while also making use of our video projection system and everything else that needs to be done. And, well, I'll, I'll tell you a secret. It cost us a pew. Poor Rhea, she went to sit down this morning and, and she had to move because where she sometimes sit was gone. <laughs> and that's because there are going to be cameras there. Uh, that's, I think, going to be the best place to put them. And, and Rhea looks great sitting where she is, so I think that'll, that'll work out fine. Belated happy birthday. So, what we do with live streaming is, is one example. Another example uh, is that we've learned that what we wear to church is not as important as it, it used to be seen to be. Uh, much less important than the attitude with which we come to church. So, shout out to all of you who are watching in one layer or less. <laughs> uh, we've learned that how we care for one another can take many different forms, from sending an email or a text to going grocery shopping for them. And we need to learn more things yet as we move through this new season, this new era of life in the world as the Church of Jesus Christ. Perhaps the biggest of these is how we can be effective as the church scattered when we can't be the church gathered. How can we be effective in ministry in our neighborhoods? One way is through Christ-filled acts of kindness and grace. When you're known as a winsome person, you will find people more willing to listen when you get an open door to have a conversation about how much your relationship with Jesus means to you. Another way is to invite your friends and neighbors to worship with you, whether in person or uh, perhaps online for the time being. If your friends and neighbors know you come to St. Paul's and they actually like you, you might be surprised at how many of them have already come to worship online with us. I, I learned that one recently myself. 
The internet is the church's front door these days. Most people who actually step across the threshold and walk in the door have already done a lot of research and they know who we are and they've seen us online and they know what we stand for and they have come having done the work and they've liked what they've seen and they want to experience it in person. So one of the ways that we can have ability is through the flexibility of our comfort zones, reaching out with the love of Jesus in tangible ways, yes, but also in verbal ways. This is what will bring strength and help to the kingdom of God and his church in our community. Again, this is another reason why we are investing significantly in online ministry. It is our first impression. Another way to be effective in ministry in neighborhoods is through neighborhood activities. You may remember a couple of years ago we uh, hired an ice cream truck to wander the streets of Nobleton and give away ice cream in honor of our 60th anniversary. That was such a hoot. And it brought us a lot of good press and uh, good brand uh, recognition as well. And then back at Easter, the session brought lilies to cheer the residents of the apartment building on Wilson Road. Same thing. But rather than try to conquer Rome by tackling the whole community, what if one of you who knows your own neighborhood better than I do or than we do prayed about an activity of some sort that the church could sponsor and be a presence for it so that your neighbors would actually enjoy and appreciate being part of it. And then, why not host a life connect group in your home when that becomes safe to do once again, composed of the people that you invited to that neighborhood event. Am I challenging you to step outside your comfort zone? Mm-hmm. Yep. Somebody probably did that as part of the process that led you to faith. So I'm challenging you to do the same for somebody else. Remember, flexibility is ability and agility is a superpower, as Gary Newhoff said. We might say, but we've always done it this way. To which Paul would ask us, don't you know that the law only applies while a person is living? If you're a follower of Jesus today, as regards the law, you're dead. Right? Because Jesus died to set you free from sin and the law. The law of Moses no longer hangs over you in the same way. To use Paul's marriage analogy, it's like you were married to Mr. or Mrs. Perfect and that person died and you married Jesus. You couldn't measure up to the one and to Jesus. He is the one who makes you measure up. Different relations. I'm asking you today to let go of your grasp on the way things have always been well. That's a word for the church context and even outside the church context. There's a lot of things in the world that are going to change because of this whole pandemic, and we need to learn to adapt. While you're at it, let go of your grasp on the notion that when the government restrictions are lifted, everything is just going to go back to the way it was before what we laughingly call normal. Because it is. Well, there are aspects of our lives that will retain some familiarity, and this is true in the church as well, but there will be other aspects that will be new. And if I could tell you what those are, I would, but I'm on the same nighttime roller coaster ride that you're on. I can't see any farther into the future than you. None of us is going through this. But we can be 100% certain of this. The Lord will be with us. We don't know what's ahead. But Jesus does. And he's in the lead. In his letter to the Romans, Paul is telling us the spirit of the law instead of the letter of the law. So hang on to the mission. But let go of your allegiance to the method. Hang on to the truth, but let go of the way we always communicate. Psalm 15, which we read earlier, is a perfect example of what legalism can look like, albeit dressed in a very nice suit. Who can come into God's presence, asks the psalmist. Then he goes on to give this long list of things that you have to do to qualify. All good advice, but not ways that you can earn God's favor. That's not grace, that's law. Legalism. If we figure we need to have everything together before we can enter the presence of God, we have missed out on what Jesus did for us. In response to the news that followers of Jesus are dead to the law, if you're willing to step outside your comfort zone to be a living incarnation of Jesus' love for the world, type flexible 
go, be, go back to the way things were once the restrictions are lifted. Don't you understand now that life in the church and life in the world will never be the same? That's you, and you're willing to be open to whatever God will do in our midst, even if it challenges you, challenges your approach. I hope that in the front on the front so on your connection card. And I'll pray for you as you work to make the adjustment of your mindset as we move forward to the work that God has called us to do as a church in this community. If you're willing to share your love for Jesus with your neighbors, the folks who live near you, in word and in deed, then type neighbors in the comments, and I will pray for you as you seek to share your faith that means so much to you with the people who live so near to you. If you're willing to offer your home for a gathering of people once a week, once we're allowed to do these things again, uh, help them learn how to love Jesus just as you do, then type home. And I'll keep you in mind as we get the opportunity to meet, to meet together again. Don't forget about people who, when this is all over, are going to want to hear about the grace of Jesus, and we've got to be ready for that. So, when we're stuck in law, especially cultural law. Right? There's lots of things that we think the Bible says, but it's actually what we think. You know, these are cultural laws that we've imposed on ourselves. It's, it's hard to offer grace if we don't live in it. We can only give what we ourselves have received. Change is real. Crisis only accelerates change. We need to be ready for the good news is that God's love never changes. His truth never changes. So with that as our cornerstone, our rock, let's move forward so that the people of our community can experience God's grace through us. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you never change. Thank you that your word never changes. We realize that culture changes all the time and now at a rate that's faster than ever. Help us to be ready. 